What's it to be then, eh? Is the Malenki tale that we're about to tell about how every Malchik has the like choice between good and evil? Or is our story, my little droogs, about how good it sometimes feels to be bad? This we know for sure. 20 years ago, a starry, though celebrated Vec called Mr. Stanley Kubrick decided that a certain film was to be withdrawn from the old cine and hid away and like never shown again. And so, of course, it's like dark legend grew and grew so that even now good folk tremble when they hear the name, A Clockwork Orange. <laughs> Over Europe, a clockwork orange is considered an art house classic. Here in Paris, it's shown daily, yet showing it in Britain is a criminal offence. Stanley Kubrick ordered Warner Brothers to withdraw the film, but only in Britain. A clockwork orange had been running in London's West End for 61 weeks when the director pulled the plug. 20 years later, this ultimate underground film still lives on, shrouded in myth and mystery a byword for contemporary violence. Orange mechanics, s'il vous plaît. Une place. Une place, oui. But never has a work conceived with such noble intentions been greeted with such relish by the boys in the back row. Oh, there are thousands of films more violent than The Clockwork Orange. It's always been suspected that Kubrick's film touches parts of the British teenager's tribal soul that other films just can't reach. Britain and A Clockwork Orange have a very special relationship. When people talk of a clockwork orange, they usually think of the mayhem in the film's first 15 minutes, when Alex and his droogs tolchock some starry vec and indulge in lashings of the old ultraviolence. For a clockwork orange is narrated in Nadsat, a brilliant combination of Cockney rhyming slang and corrupted Russian. Nadsat was devised by Anthony Burgess in his original 1962 novel to act as a screen between the reader and the horrors of the book. But, as Burgess noted, a film is not made of words. How are thou, thou globby bottle of cheap, stinking chip oil? Come and get one in the yarbles! If you have any yarbles, you eunuch jelly thou! Let's get it, boys! Very few intellectual works say violence is pleasurable, violence is exciting, violence is intensely gratifying, as intensely gratifying as almost anything else you could ever experience in your life. It's up there with the extremes of pornography, the extremes of sexual experience, the extremes of religious ecstasy. It's an absolute moment of absolute intensity. And very few people are saying that. And the film says that to the extent that it's prepared to celebrate it. The film is about how good it feels to be bad. That's, that's undeniable. A great vitality of Malcolm McDowell's performance comes from that swaggering, banting, bantering, flamboyant language, the jet stream of NADSAT dialogue, a dialect that Anthony Burgess invented. It has a swagger of a Shakespearean hero about it, like Mercutio. At the same time, it has the enjoyment in evil that Milton invested in, in the devil. A Clockwork Orange was conceived in violence. During the Second World War, Anthony Burgess's first wife, Lynn, was viciously assaulted by four GI deserters. The crime found its fictional echo in A Clockwork Orange's notorious rape scene. Burgess has admitted that he felt a vicarious thrill when composing Alex's reminiscences of ultraviolence and the old in-out. I was sickened by my own excitement at setting it down, he said, and saw that Alden was right in saying that the novelist must be filthy with the filthy. The 
fill it around for a while with other travelers of the night, playing hogs of the road. Then we headed west. What we were after now was the old surprise visit. That was a real kick, and good for laughs and lashings of the old ultra-violent. It's this ambivalence that makes the film artistic dynamite, the subtext that some people might actually find rape and murder fun. The sequence where Alex and his droogs invade the home of the writer uh, has in it the quality of an American musical. In fact, it was uh, uh, Malcolm McDowell who suggested to Stanley Kubrick that when he is putting the boot into Patrick McGee being held prisoner on the floor, he should do it to the strains of Singing in the Rain. It's like a horrible version of the soft shoe shuffle. Uh, so that you've got to say that this film is, in its way, as balletic and as musical as West Side Story. Let the storm <laughs> Everyone from the place goes off. I'm armed with the rain. I have a smile on my face. I'll walk down the lane with a happy refrain. And I'm singing. Just singing. In the rain. Do be do, do be do, be do be do, do be do, be do be do. These things happen, they are part of society, they are appalling, but they exist, they shape people's thinking, they are part of our culture, and it's absolutely right in my view that film should be able to deal with them. How explicit they should deal with it is, I think, a matter of judgment this filmmaker chose to show it in a particular way. It certainly was absolutely horrendous, but it worked. One always finds rape is uh, the most horrendous, horrendous, absolutely. It's, it's quite um, a monstrous thing to even contemplate. Um, I think, actually, it was handled in the film rather well. I, in fact, I think that there wasn't the amount of gratuitous violence that people imagined there was. It was all in their own heads, actually. I mean, I, I remember with my own killing, which was, I don't know whether you remember, that I was um, having, fighting for my life with my, all I had to defend myself was my little statue of Beethoven. And he was using my three-foot phallus. But you didn't actually see my death, I don't think. I think you saw my open mouth as he was just about to finish me off. Real violence, you hear the softness of the head when it hits the pavement. Um, real violence, when someone gets hit, there's a sort of smack on the skin, which is, you can almost hear the hairs of the skin. It, it, it's not loud, it's, it's intimately physical. This is very stylized violence. It's got lots of sound effects. It's amplified. It uses a bit of feedback. Even the blood itself is quite stylized. Because again, real blood, uh, it sort of sits there on the pavement and kind of beads up. It's, it's not pretty like the, the blood when they have their little slashes or the blood that's meant to be coming out of the mouth. Um, so it's a very stylized violence. I mean, it's, it's violence offered up not unlike uh, you know, the, the music into which the whole violence is, is is dropped. It's it's off, it's orchestrated violence. It's, it's violence in a kind of symphonic way. And it was like for a moment, oh my brothers, some great bird had flown into the milk bar. But is this love of great music evidence that little Alex has a spark of goodness waiting to be ignited, or is it just a classy backing track for grievous bodily harm? because I knew what she sang. It was a bit from the glorious ninth by Ludwig van. Was a clockwork orange really a danger to society? Certainly a young Dutch secretary was assaulted while a gang chanted singing in the rain. And a Jehovah's Witness was beaten up by a gang dressed as droogs. 
and an old tramp was kicked to death by a 16-year-old said to be obsessed with the film. These cases can't be dismissed as mere tabloid hyperbole. Rapes and beatings were dished out as Kubrick's symphony of violence rang in the heads of the perpetrators. But whether these crimes would have been committed without the prompting of a clockwork orange is another question entirely. I think it was manipulated by the press of the time and, and made us a, 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 a bet noir, something to blame, a foreign body that, that could be looked at and, and asked to take all the, the, the ills of society on its shoulders. No other country in the world treated that way. And there are, there are many societies that are far more violent in, in terms of what they see in film and television than ours. Art has the greatest possible uh, propaganda influence. So when people say, oh, no, it can't have any influence, I mean, you have to be balmy. It's like saying advertising has no influence. It's like seeing people who see uh, great movies about being boxers, uh, and all the kids want to box, and they see Wimbledon, all the kids want to play tennis. And of course, uh, uh, any form of a stimulus like that is, uh, is a very, very seductive to young people. But while Stanley Kubrick chooses to remain silent about Clockwork Orange, Anthony Burgess has consistently defended himself and his creation. Neither cinema nor literature can be blamed for crimes committed in its name, he wrote. If literature is to be held responsible for mayhem and murder, then the most damnable book of all is the Bible. In Alex's prison fantasy, he chooses not to love Christ, but to beat him. And it's this freedom to choose between good and evil that's at the heart of a clockwork orange. I read all about the scourging and the crowning with thorns. And I could vidy myself helping in and even taking charge of the toll chocking and the nailing in, being dressed in the height of Roman fashion. The idea of him being uh, like a Roman uh, centurion beating Jesus was just part of the fun. What uh, Alex sets out to do is to be purely an anarchist, and that's all he is. He ridicules and rejects the society in which he is part of. In Britain, a clockwork orange has always been infinitely more than a morality tale or an art house classic. It touched a peculiarly resonant chord in British adolescence. This is us, see? We're today. If you don't dig us, shoot away some square joint to the rest of the creeps. Or well, why not stick around and get with it? In the land that spawned teddy boys, mods, rockers, skinheads and punks, a clockwork coin seemed like a celebration of all the old teenage cults and was good enough to suggest a new one. spoke our language. It understood that submerging yourself in a tribe turns a nobody into a somebody. Before, society didn't even notice you, and now it fears you. Post-war British teens, used to seeking their identity in youth cults, perfectly understood the social life of Alex and his identically dressed droogs. In young Alex, every British youth who ever wore the uniform of a teenage tribe could glimpse his own reflection. And I bidded right at once what to do. My crude, irrational view is that there's something about this island culture which has produced the most violent people I've ever seen, where violence is at the heart of the culture. It's in the sort of the day-to-day -day bits of the culture. It's in the pub, it's in the street, it's in a traffic jam, it's in how males deal with each other. And to that extent, I would say the film isn't British, but it's English. Um, and it's, it captures something about that particular island sensibility of the boastful, bloated, beer-drinking, violent male. Um, who's such a special feature of the culture here. 